Hello, this is Dr. Marty Lustig, Senior Vice President with NextGen Healthcare and Principal with NextGen Advisors. Welcome to our podcast series. In our August 14th podcast, we discuss the opportunities and challenges associated with integrating behavioral health with physical medicine. Since September is Mental Health Month, we've decided to devote today's discussion to mental health issues, and particularly depression in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm joined by my colleagues, Graham Brown and Dr. Betty Rubinowitz. Welcome, Graham and Betty. Good morning, Marty. Nice to be with you. Hi, Marty. Hello. Even prior to the pandemic, depression has impacted about one out of six adults in the U.S., and it's expected to be the leading cause of disability over the next 20 years. And suicide is already the 10th leading cause of death in the country. Aside from the suffering of individuals afflicted with depression, family and work relationships are often impacted, not to mention the estimated 30 to $40 billion of annual economic impact. Before we get into the issues related to the pandemic, I'd like to hear your perspectives on the implications of these statistics for healthcare providers in general. Graham? It doesn't surprise me in some ways that the general population would have a similar experience with regard to depression and suicidal ideation that uh, medical providers would. You know, if we look at the population, doctors and and nurses and other uh, medical practitioners aren't necessarily any different than the rest of us. So hearing that those levels are as high as they are is concerning overall. When we, when we do think about some of the ongoing day-to-day pressures that physicians and clinicians find themselves in, uh, you can see where some of those problems might exacerbate, might be worse, where they might be in more stressful or really difficult decision-making situations um, that could make all of these elements more problematic. Betty? I think what's striking to me is how prevalent depression is in practice. and what that means for the way we prepare medical students and residents and practitioners to tackle uh, treating patients with depression. And, and clearly, in the separation kind of of mind and body that's occurred in, in healthcare, many providers find themselves pretty ill-equipped to deal, to diagnose and treat this extremely common condition. So. I think it's a it's a um, message to uh, healthcare educators, to practitioners. This is an important, very common condition that we need to get better at identifying, better at treating, and that it is uh, certainly the the burden of suffering both and risk is is present and uh, extremely. Uh, uh, important when you when you think of, for example, a, a specialty like primary care. It, it it's funny that there's discomfort with this, despite the fact that there are actually pretty effective treatments. I don't know, Betty, if you can talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Um, clearly, the the face of treatment of uh, depression has changed in the last twenty years or so with the advent of of newer drug modalities that are well tolerated uh, easily prescribed with the, with the skill set of a primary care uh, clinician and it's it's quite amazing to see how many primary care visits where the underlying cause for the patient's visit is truly emotional anguish get assigned to a physical symptom that gets dealt with uh, the depression is is not unmasked not discussed and therefore not treated. It, it, it um, is a measure of some of the, the uh, forces in primary care, but also a measure of our societal stigma around mental health, behavioral health issues, and the notion that uh, having depression is less honorable than having tuberculosis. It, it, we bring our prejudice very clearly into the exam room uh, on both sides of of the exam room, the clinicians and the patients. Well said. Now let's turn to the impact of COVID on depression. 
What do you see as the implications of the pandemic, both for those who already have mental health, health problems, as well as those with no prior history? Graham? The you know, existence of, of existing issues for folks is clearly, I would imagine, being exacerbated and just brought into greater focus and a greater sense of uh, impact by the COVID-19 pandemic. Requiring individuals and as we've done for community to prevent community spread has translated into policies around uh, isolating ourselves and making sure that we're protecting each other. That that alone puts people into a situation where they don't have the connections, where they're not con- getting the types of therapies potentially that they might have done, don't have the interaction with their social networks. And so I would imagine that that's helping to increase the impact of some of the existing underlying conditions. For those that haven't experienced mental health challenges before, I'm similarly, the COVID pandemic is probably putting individuals in a situation where they're experiencing some of these impacts for the first time. And that can be really disconcerting for individuals who may not have a direct awareness of what uh, mental health feels like and looks like in their own lives. So those elements of isolation, the ability to really um, connect with other individuals and have social actions, interactions, uh, I would imagine is is making all of this more problematic. Betty? Psychosocial stressors uh, with angst around safety, livelihood, work, uh, the isolation from work with many people working from home has obviously put an added burden on people with pre-existing uh, tendency or uh, clear uh, depression, and I'm sure has increased the ranks of people struggling with depression right now. It's. I also was thinking yesterday as we approach 200,000 deaths in this country from COVID about the circles of grief and sadness that surround those deaths where even our um, rituals around uh, mourning and burial and funerals have been altered drastically and that each of these families becomes a uh, a kind of a nidus or a, a focus of incredible sadness and loss that hasn't had the mitigation of the social rituals that we usually are allowed to engage in when uh, when this loss occurs. So for many of us, this is a very sad time. For others, it's a time of great angst and worry, a lot of stress around childcare and children being at home and the uh, stress around schools reopening. Uh, So this is a challenging time, certainly for people who are vulnerable and many others. Yeah, it's like a a perfect storm for for stress (laughs) Uh, from so many different angles. One little twist on this, Graham, as you were talking about the social isolation, a colleague of mine at the very beginning of the pandemic, when the recommendations for social distancing came out, called me and said, we need to do something about this. We should be calling it physical distancing, not social distancing. People are going to feel isolated. It's going to exacerbate mental health issues. And we, sh- you know, we should reinforce that social connectivity is going to be critical, even though you have to physically distance. And I think he had a great point that great unfortunately point. Uh, didn't get heard across the country. So I'd like to turn now to some of uh, what we've been hearing as we've talked to providers across the country, and mental health issues have been discussed frequently in those interviews. What did you take away from those conversations that might be helpful to other providers? Betty, you want to start? Sure. I think there were two clear messages. The first was that for an organization to thrive th- through this period of change, there had to be an awareness and a focus on the well being of the teams, the care teams. And that organizations that were thoughtful and proactive around that <clears throat> were able to fare better uh, through the storm by creating opportunities for physicians and care teams to share experiences, to Uh, talk about their uh, concerns and anxieties, that effective communication with the team about information, workflows, uh, 
changes to workflows. Why those changes were being made was more critical than ever. That transparency of leadership to, uh, uh, to communicate those changes was extremely important. So self-care and care, and care team care became really uh, very important. That was one issue. And the second was that telemedicine offered an incredible opportunity to continue reaching out to patients and uh, continue providing behavioral health uh, services, but even reaching out to patients who did not specifically fall under the category of behavioral health, and that groups that took advantage of that modality early uh, were able to offer their patients a great service. Yeah. Some of the things that were really interesting to hear, to build on what Betty just said, was how, particularly with some of the behavioral health clinics that we talked to, they had a very proactive and intentional approach to how they were going to support each other through this. And I think being practitioners in that space, they recognized the stresses and risks that they and their care teams were going to be going through. And so I think they really tried um, very intentionally to create a support structure within their care team to ensure that they were talking through issues, elevating concerns, providing the right supports to each other, and just sharing their stories so that they really were supporting and backing each other up. That was really heartening to hear. At the same time, maybe outside of the interviews and discussions we had directly with some of the uh, the client leaders across the country, some of my own personal experiences, you know, I, each of us knows a lot of different folks in the healthcare field in different roles and uh, positions. And speaking to some of my colleagues and friends who have been working in hospitals and treating COVID patients, They've then, you know, in their own personal lives, been living separately from their spouses, living on a different floor, isolating at home. Um, they're not into inter- able to interact with their partners uh, or their friends in the same way that uh, they had in the past. So I do think even outside of the work environment, these impacts kind of translate more deeply into everyone's personal lives, uh, and particularly for those who are you know, providing healthcare directly to infected individuals. That's that's in, above and beyond then the decision-making that some of these folks have needed to go through, particularly at earlier stages in the pandemic when there were indeed shortages of personal protective equipment, very high-risk individuals that needed ventilation, and, you know, clinical decisions needed to be made and moral decisions needed to be made on who is appropriate to get that level of care. That kind of decision making just, you know, everyone I think recognizes is part of the medical profession, but when it really comes to that level of, um, you know, the point of a pin, it's pretty dramatic and pretty uh, impactful, I would imagine, for folks in this situation to have to just wrestle with and then process. That kind of brings me to the next issue I wanted to talk about, which was the particular stresses that the pandemic has created for healthcare workers. And I would go back to the June report of the emergency department physician in Manhattan, who on, you know, unfortunately committed suicide, really brought the whole issue uh, to the headlines. Betty, can you talk a little about the particular risks that providers face and perhaps give us your thoughts on ways to lower those risks? Sure. I think Graham outlined some of the moral, ethical dilemmas and safety dilemmas and concerns that physicians have, and care teams as a whole, I I use physicians just as a providers as a a, a general term, but this is nurses and uh, respiratory therapists and technicians and um, all uh, those that staff a, a, a medical team have been faced with a work environment that is incredibly uh, altered and changed from what they're used to, huge volumes, fatigue, uh, shifts that are long and intense with no uh, rest, heartbreak around them with separating very ill patients from their family and support system where they have become the emotional support system for patients because their families are removed and and, and not available. All of that puts uh, incredible uh, burden on physicians. There's also a incredible cognitive and emotional dissonance between their experience and the pictures on the TV screen of uh, 
people recklessly partying in large groups in absence of uh, social distancing, in absence of masks, which creates a sense of here we are putting ourselves at incredible personal risk. There's over a thousand healthcare providers who have died in, uh, in this pandemic putting ourselves in, at risk, working around the clock, removed from our families, struggling with ethical and, and moral uh, dilemmas where others aren't respectful of that, um, that reality by protecting themselves and, and, and others. And I'm hearing growing frustration from healthcare providers around that. If for no other reasons, just to protect us and respect us, please uh, do what you need to do in terms of uh, social distancing, uh, or as you say, Marley, physical distancing and uh, mask wearing. So this is a very difficult time uh, for providers at the front lines. And this is across the board. Um, uh, primary care physicians who are seeing patients now in the office are PPE required as well. There's changes in their workflow. There's volume decrease and threat, uh, uh, existential livelihood threat to them. Very complicated time for uh, people at the front, uh, on the front lines. Graham? I think Betty really spoke very eloquently about some of the pressures and, and um, direct experiences that she's observed. And the, the call to action that she just said, I think is really important. That dissonance between broad societal behaviors and the direct impact that ultimately this has two to three weeks down the road when people become very ill with a novel coronavirus that's not well understood and go into a hospital or a clinical environment where as a result you know a whole mix of care team uh, members are themselves then at risk where they need to you know non-protective equipment every day end up with scars on their faces and wounds from wearing masks isolate themselves from their families the the broadening you know this is a, a drop in the ocean that creates ripples and i think that there's a real disconnect from individual behaviors and how it plays out and uh, ultimately is impacting others so that's that's something that's important i think for us to remember that there there is a result of our actions and we have a responsibility to each other so i'd like to uh bring it up to a more positive note to end on. Uh, and that is that, you know, as, as we've listened around the country and spoken with leaders from uh, provider organizations, I've found it inspirational uh, how many of these leaders have done such a phenomenal job of supporting their organizations that they, they really understand their role in meeting the needs of everyone in their organization so that their organization can meet the needs of the community that they serve. And even in some of the very large organizations, we heard leaders be, talk about individual stories. They clearly are you know, daily in touch with exactly what's going on within their own organizations. They have personal relationships with the frontline staff. You know, they're making sure that they're doing everything they can to meet the needs of their own staff. And in turn, they're serving the communities in an incredibly high level. So on that note of appreciation, I'd like to wrap up. Thank our listeners for joining us today. I'd like to thank Dr. Betty Rabinowitz and Graham Brown for sharing their insights and perspectives on this really critically important issue. If you enjoyed today's discussion, consider subscribing to our podcast. This is Dr. Marty Lustig with NextGen Healthcare. Have a great day.